Does it offer any kind of advantage in competition with other men? Good morning, friends. In this video, I'm going to tell you for the first time what your neck says about you. But before I do, please subscribe to the channel if you're not already, like the video, and comment on the video for the sake of the algorithm. Now let's get started. As originally postulated by Charles Darwin, men's secondary sexual characteristics evolved in order to improve their reproductive success. In particular, our secondary sexual characteristics evolved to improve our reproductive success through two mechanisms. One is by improving what's called intrasexual success. That is men's ability to succeed in fighting with other men so that they're the only ones who can reproduce. And the second is intersexual selection. That's a man's ability to attract a woman directly instead of being able to defeat other men and being the maybe only available man. For the last several decades, sexually dimorphic traits, those are the secondary sexual characteristics that differ between men and women, have been studied quite a bit, in particular with regard to ratios. Let me introduce you to three here, which we'll talk about in later videos. In particular in men, the 2D to 4D ratio, that is the ratio of your index finger length to your ring finger length, was studied the earliest. It's still quite well studied and reveals many things, which I'll I'll talk to you about in a later video, but in particular, it reflects intrauterine testosterone levels. That's the testosterone levels a person was experienced to while in the womb. On the other hand, the face width to height ratio began to be studied in the early 2000s, and that ratio seems to indicate facial masculinity in some ways. I'll talk to you about this again in a future video. And in women, the ratio most studied is the waist to hip ratio, a ratio which we'll discuss in future videos as well. Here, we want to find out, is the neck particularly the neck muscularity and size, a sexually dimorphic trait? And if so, how powerful of an indicator is it for a man's masculinity? Now, I'm making this video mainly to introduce you to a 2021 paper from this year that has not been cited by anybody except the paper's own authors, so it's not very well known yet. But before we get to that very fascinating paper, let's see what the research indicated historically. First of all, neck size was first theorized to be a sexually dimorphic trait by Carrier and Morgan in 2015. In fact, they went so far to hypothesize that neck size may be the most sexually dimorphic trait that is easily visible to us. And this was in line with a 2001 study on sleep apnea that found that men's neck structure more influenced their sleep apnea incidence than women, indicating that men's neck structure was more different and more consequential maybe to their health, for example, than women's. And this was also in line with a 2008 study that found that women's neck size compared to their head size varied more than men's neck size compared to their head size. Women's neck size were on average 9 to 16 percent smaller than men's neck size, while women's head size was only on average 3 to 6% smaller. And women's necks were of course also weaker. They were on average 32% weaker on flexion and 20% weaker on extension. And also, before we get into the 2021 study, why would men have bigger necks than women? Does it offer any kind of advantage in competition with other men? It does in fact. In terms of intersexual competition, the research has been a bit muddled because a lot of the research on facial masculinity has included pictures of necks. So this has never been studied independently, but it's been included in many of the studies on how facial masculinity attracts women. But previous research particularly indicates that neck size may really influence intrasexual selection. That means that it may influence men's competitive ability to compete with other men. And in particular, this is because the neck muscles are thought to stabilize the head in response to blows to the head, such that a bigger, more muscular neck stabilizes the head more and those men get less concussions when hit on the head. And this makes sense. As you'll see from my first video on how boxing affects the brain, the rotational force done to the head is the most important factor in determining the level of damage done to the brain, such that the stability from the neck is really critical in limiting that rotational force. And finally, we get to the 2021 paper that nobody cited before, which probably indicates that none of you have ever heard of this before. I certainly didn't. Now let's quickly review the methods used in the paper. There are three things the paper really did. The first is that they judged whether UFC fighters were more likely to be successful in fights or be more successful fighters if they had wider necks. In particular, they looked at the sternocleidomastoid muscle, which is here on the side of the neck, which indicates width of the neck. And they looked at the upper trapezius, which most people call their traps up here. They found that the size of these muscles correlated very well with the success fighters had. 
and that this correlation was higher for more successful fighters, such that it may be even more important to more successful fighters to develop their neck musculature than less successful fighters. Maybe the neck musculature has a greater effect at higher levels of competition than lower levels. However, they also found that the correlation between neck size and head size was greater for more successful fighters. And though they didn't say it themselves, I thought that this may indicate that the greater head size was also important among very successful fighters. I've heard UFC fighters before describe their head size as being a limiting factor for them getting concussed or knocked out. They also found that the less successful fighters had more downward facing jaws, whereas the more successful fighters had more upward facing jaws in their pictures. And they reasoned this to be because of the effect of the increased neck musculature on where the jaw is positioned. And what this may mean is that if you see a man standing like this with his jaw out and with a bigger neck, he may be more formidable and may be more dangerous for you to fight with. Second, they looked at US Army personnel data, in particular data that contained 93 anatomical measurements of these personnel. They found that neck width among all the 93 anatomical measurements was the best predictor of gender. And third, using 178 participants, using photorealistic stimuli where they manipulated the neck size, in particular that muscle I mentioned, as well as the trapezius muscle size, and they asked these 178 people to rate these photorealistic stimuli on the basis of how strong the men appeared to be, how masculine they appeared to be, and how likely the women were to want to sleep with the men. In particular, they asked them about their short-term attractiveness. This is a measure often studied because it was discovered quite early on that women have different features that they look for in long-term relationships rather than short-term attractiveness. And we'll discuss this more in a future video, but short-term attractiveness basically indicates a woman's separate interest in having sex with a man as opposed to marrying and having children with a man. Now let's review what we learned in this video. First of all, we learned that neck size is an important protective measure for men's ability to avoid concussions from heavy trauma to the head and is actually physically useful in fighting. Second, we learned that neck size is associated with fighting success even among the best fighters of the world, and particularly among them. Third, we learned that women rate men with bigger necks as more masculine and as appearing stronger, and that they're more interested in having sex with those men. Anyway, friends, I hope this was interesting for you. It was for me. As you guys have seen from my recent videos, I'm trying to make videos about subjects that nobody's ever made videos about before, or actually, in particular, I'm actually trying to make videos about subjects that nobody's ever written about explicitly before. If you like these kinds of videos, please share them with others, because that's the way the channel has been growing. It's due to you guys, and I'm very grateful for your help. I'll see you again this afternoon. Thank you.